uh, Dr. Mesquia, about Raphael, right? He's the dandy professor of neurosurgery or radiology, uh, director of vision of cerebrovascular surgery, vice chair of the department and co-director of the neurocritical care at Johns Hopkins. Uh, had a tremendous history. I, when I first came in 2005, he and I traveled several times in Latin America. We had great times. We have some pictures of us in Latin America that I didn't want to show, but we do have one that I can mention where we're all with sombreros in Mexico, somewhere in Cancun. And I didn't want to show it because there was a lot of alcohol involved at that time. So we, we tried to keep this PG-13, but uh, we had a great time with Rafael traveling and doing great things, actually. And I still remember one time on a weekend that I was on call around 2007. And I was definitely tired and I, we had been operated I think between Friday and Saturday. And he came in to do rounds Saturday midday. And I remember he saw me, he realized uh, in the resident that was postponed in myself. And uh, he said, hey, come on, let's go. He got us in his car and he took us to a small little uh, place to have pizza and a beer. And it was amazing, Rafael. It was really, really great. Not only and exactly what James said, and a scholar, a tremendously accomplished, but also gentle and kind, gentle with people and uh, just a tremendous role model, accomplished in ways beyond what I can tell you in words. You can actually see his education all the way from Princeton to Columbia, to uh, Johns Hopkins and rise to the uh, climb the ladder in academics, but also to become the Walter Dandy. We talk about Dandy often here, many, many awards, you know, as recent and as back as when he became a professor in, uh, uh, in the chair of uh, the, the Walter Dandy chair. That was directly from the family and also from the vision of Dr. Bram, as well as they were partners even before that at Columbia and they continue to work together. So it was just beautiful to see this and to interact with Rafael. Tremendous amount of work in the literature. We'll get to hear about his uh, uh, area of expertise and what makes him passionate about this. A tremendous impact in the literature. You can see all the many citations, his age index, really, really out of uh, you know several standard deviations where we have actually chairs of neurosurgery nowadays you know, with their age index. And we, tra we track these, Raphael, for our own residents nowadays for faculty so they can understand their impact on the literature, you know. And of course, as I said before, as, I, as James, you know, alluded to, he is not only extraordinarily gifted as a surgeon, as a scholar, but he is also gifted as a friend, as a colleague, as a mentor. And he serves as a mentor for many of us, Kai, right here as well. Kai, are you on the line by any chance? Yeah, sorry, I'm here trying to would offload you, a spine patient. <laughs> would you mind um, just saying a few words as I, I had the last slide for Raphael right here? Yeah, uh, Raphael has been, uh, Dr. Tamara has been my mentor since day one of neurosurgery. Basically, I was going to go to an orthopedics and I had a rotation with him. And he basically changed my mind to go into neurosurgery. And go, I initially wanted to do spine, changed my mind to cranial. Uh, a lot of what I do today is I rely on what I did with Dr. Tamargo as a med student, as a resident, even faculty. I had an acoustic last week. I was always thinking, what would Dr. Tamargo do? Um, so I, I'm incredibly indebted to Dr. Tamargo. Happy to have him here. Thank you. Wonderful. All right. So I'm going to go and stop the chair right here, Raphael, and pivot to you and let you chair. You can see how many 71 participants, but in some of those participants, Raphael, there are rooms with five or 10 people because they allow us to do a small congregation. So we have probably over 100 people listening to your talk from all over the world. So very excited <laughs> to have you. <laughs> well, uh, thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Alfredo. And uh, I mean, I, I really, <clears throat> really have no words to, to thank you for for your kind uh, words. <clears throat> and um, <clears throat> it, it, it's a tremendous pleasure to see you uh, see Kai and and also uh, see all the amazing things that that you're that you're doing. Um, so let me see if uh, if I can if I can share the the screen. So can yeah. can you see my first slide? Absolutely. We we'll see the title of this slide with the pictures and everything. Oh, okay, great, great, beautiful. So um, so anyway. Um, again, it's it's just a tremendous pleasure, and congratulations, uh, Alfredo, to uh, to what you're doing, and and Kai. Um, it's um, 
and uh, again, I, it's just a tremendous pleasure. And thank you, thank you very much for your kind words. So anyway, I'm I'm going to talk today about the indications for aneurysm clipping in the uh, endovascular era. Um, so um, the um, I I have no financial uh, conflicts for better or for worse, um, and um, and I'll tell you the the uh, the first. The first paper, uh, the first solid endovascular treatment was the introduction of the uh, of the uh, Juliemi coils. Um, that that paper came out in 1991, and um, and by a couple of years later, already people were were saying, uh, you know, people would come up to me and say, well, you know, it looks like um, that you won't be clipping any more aneurysms in five years from now. Um, so that that would have put it in, in like 1996 and all that, but uh, even though I've been hearing that um, uh, since since the mid 1990s, here we are in 2021, and um, and and clipping of aneurysms is uh, going on strong, as I will um, uh, as I will uh, show you. Um, part of it is that there it's it's simple uh, anatomy, you know. There there's some uh, aneurysms like these wide-necked um, uh, MCA aneurysms that that are not amenable uh, for coils or or stents. Um, <clears throat> then there are aneurysms like this one, uh, this uh, pica uh, aneurysm, which uh, has uh, shares its origin with uh, with pica, and and again um, uh, it it could be coiled, but chances are it would recur. Um, and, and then, of course, you have the giant lesions, like this giant MCA aneurysm with uh, thrombus uh, that are, are very difficult to treat uh, endovascularly. So, um, so basically, how uh, let, let's put a historical perspective on how things uh, uh, came around. So the first uh, effective treatment for aneurysms was clipping, uh, introduced in uh, 1937, by by Walter Dandy, he published his paper. Forty three year old patient who had been um, at Hopkins for a few days with uh, diplopia and ptosis of the right eye, and he had a posterior communicating artery aneurysm. And based on the neurological exam, he was referred by Dr. Frank uh, Walsh uh, of ophthalmology to Dandy, and Dandy explored him and clipped a posterior communicating artery uh, aneurysm. The, the field stayed uh, at that level um, until the 1960s when the microscope was introduced. So the, the microscope was introduced in neurosurgery by ENT surgeons, specifically neuroautologists. And, um, and it was brought into the United States, as far as I can tell, by, um, by William House of the House Clinic in, in California. And, um, and then, um, uh, William House uh, impressed uh, Dr. Ted Kersey, who, um, who then introduced the microscope in, in neurosurgery. Um, here is a paper by uh, Larry Poole at, uh, at Columbia, published in 1966. Um, and it's a, um, it's a brief paper that basically says, um, uh, hey, we've been using this new device, the microscope, and it seems to be uh, helpful. Um, uh, things, uh, so then people start using the microscope in neurosurgery and, um, and the uh, field uh, uh, shifted to Switzerland where uh, Hugo Kreienbull and Gassi Yassergil uh, published this paper with Eugene Flam and, and John Tu, um, uh, chairmans, uh, uh, both retired chairmen in uh, but they, they went to Switzerland to, to learn uh, uh, the techniques, the microsurgical techniques. And of course, Gassi Yassergil elevated the field uh, to, to where it is now, along with other great um, uh, neurosurgeons, in, including Charles Drake in Toronto. And then uh, Yassergil published this uh, four volume um, uh, book on microneurosurgery um, in, in 1984. Um, uh, Thor Sund uh, from the Mayo Clinic uh, really introduced this uh, new um, and uh, successful field of uh, microvascular neurosurgery 
in this New England Journal paper in 1978. This paper had, uh, had a tremendous impact because it basically announced to the uh, medical community that uh, neurosurgery had, um, uh, was in the process of, um, of really providing uh, uh, excellent results for people with um, uh, ruptured aneurysms. Um, 280 patients uh, were operated. Um, uh, at Mayo, and uh, and as you can see, the mortality uh, for the Botterell grading system of grade one to grade four is really not very different from from uh, what we have uh, today. Um, so then, um, in 1990, um, there there was a, a dramatic uh, new development. People had tried to use uh, devices for endovascular treatment of aneurysms, you know, there were the uh, uh, Shegloff uh, uh, balloons from Kiev and, and, and other early devices, but they didn't work very well. But then Guido Giuliani moved from Italy to, um, to UCLA and at UCLA, they provided the environment for him to develop uh, the coils. And, um, and in uh, 1991, uh, 1990 to 1991, they treated 15 patients and then published two papers back to back in uh, general neurosurgery, uh, introducing uh, this uh, field. Um, uh, historically, uh, the, the field uh, was essentially dominated by, by coiling, but then as uh, problems with coiling started to emerge, um, <clears throat> there was the introduction of the, of the pipeline. Um, and, and this was another uh, technological uh, revolution uh, because it was a stent that allowed the aneurysm to, uh, that, that induced the thrombosis of the aneurysm, but then allowed the surrounding vessels to remain open. The first um, uh, case report of two patients was in 2009 by Fiorella and his group. And then the first uh, uh, large series was the next year uh, out of Argentina. And that basic, basically established the field. And then most recently, uh, the introduction of web de the web device has been um, uh, the next major advance. Um, it was first reported in 2011, and it was FDA approved in December of 2018. So um, as we evaluate these uh, treatments, um, there, there have been many, um, many criteria that have been put forward to uh, decide whether a treatment is, uh, is I think that we might have lost the audio there, Raphael. Andres, can you hear Raphael? I can't, no. Dr. Tamargo, I think that we lost the audio. And the picture too. I can still see the presentation. Maybe he lost connection. Maybe. The picture is still there. Yes, I see Gabriel commenting. The presentation is still here. It's, it might have gotten frozen because it's not moving either. As we are going, uh, maybe we, we it, I think it might have gotten frozen. Maybe uh, Dr. Talk, are you on the line? to provide some yes. commentary. Let's see if we can, uh, if Raphael may be able to re-log in, because I think that he got frozen. Yes, absolutely. I'm, uh, I'm actually looking forward to see what's his conclusion on this topic. Yes, so, so the first we... part of it is an is amazing tour of the force of the history, all right? And some of you witnessed as well. And as we're waiting to see, we can reconnect with Raphael. Can you provide some perspective also from your 
and, and Dr. Miller, I think, is on the line as well because he's in the evolution of all this. So we'll start with you, Ravi, and then we'll pivot to Dr. Miller and see if we can get Raphael back. Yes, so it's, uh, I mean, I'm, his comment just uh, kind of uh, struck me is uh, what, what people were saying. There's many uh, people in the field uh, who literally said that you guys will be out of business for for uh, open vascular surgeons. We, you will never be clipping an aneurysm. You will never, I mean, endovascular is great. It's, it's a great advancement and it's a great complementary treatment for many aneurysms, especially the ruptured one. Uh, definitely uh, for the ruptured aneurysms, uh, the first line of treatment, if you can, is endovascular because the ISAT did show uh, improved outcome uh, for uh, for a coiled aneurysm compared to clipped aneurysm. The difference was around six or seven percent improvement in outcome. The uh, open surgery is still here. It's still and will stay probably because many endovascular uh, or aneurysm cannot simply be repaired by clipping, uh, especially when we talk about reimplantation of vessels and vascular reconstruction. Sometimes uh, a group of vessels is falling apart and becoming an aneurysmal dilatation. And this is the simple differentiation from my perspective. It's uh, whether it's a small rent in the vessel wall that causes the aneurysm and then that aneurysm you can clip it you can coil it whatever you do it's going to be easily fixed uh, when uh, i don't want to keep going if dr tamargo is on the line actually but uh, not yet he i, not guess yet. Him. I think he's, i think he got frozen because the picture hasn't moved either yes. actually for, for so, some reason i tested him yeah, so uh, many aneurysm are, are much more than just a simple part of the walls for, uh, falling. Many aneurysm involve the, the large circumference of the vessel diameter, and those aneurysm, they can recur even after clipping or endovascular, unless you pay close attention to how much is involved. So definitely... Uh, and then a few words about Dr. Tamargo. I mean, he's, he's, the, he's, he's the guy I who think was... He's He's back. Raphael, yeah. are you back? Oh, good. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah, okay. We got okay, frozen. Great. We got frozen. But I was having Ravi give a commentary, and he was just talking about what you said, that they told you back in the 90s that surgery was going to go away, and clearly hasn't. So we were just talking. So take it away, Raphael. Okay, so, uh, <laughs> the, uh, so you, you saw this slide about I said. And, I, and we, we got stuck in this slide. You know, the best criterion to assess the long-term efficacy of aneurysm treatment. So a uh, repeat treatment rates. I think that we got oh, stuck okay. at that slide. Okay, yeah. this one, this one. Uh, uh, we don't see it. Let's see if you can share it with us. Oh, okay. Uh, hold on. We, we see your image now, so that's okay. Great. We're beginning to see something now. We're beginning to share your screen. Okay, can you see it? We see your screen. There you go. That's the one. That's that's where we got okay. stuck right there. Good. Perfect. Yeah. Okay. So take it away. So, yeah. So <laughs> what I, what I was saying is that that in terms of assessing the efficacy of uh, treatment, uh, there are several criteria. Now, the uh, uh, first one is the rupture rate, uh, but the rupture rate takes too long to assess given an annual rate of 1% per year uh, of rupture. And you, you may be doing the wrong thing for 10 to 20 years uh, until you say, um, you know, my rupture rate is too high. So then there's the, uh, the angiographic anatomical residual, um, uh, the, uh, well, the prognostic significance of these residuals is unclear. And of course it leads to a lot of uh, debate. Um, and then there's the angiographic anatomical recurrence but again, the prognostic significance of a recurrence is unclear. What, what I think is a very, uh, the best way of um, uh, assessing uh, these treatments that we're using for aneurysms is the repeat treatment rates, because this is a significant event that can be objectively measured. You know, if a, if a neurosurgeon and a uh, patient decide to go ahead and retreat their aneurysm, uh, then uh, obviously something, something important has uh, has happened. 
So, so then let's look at the literature. This, uh, this was the, uh, the first large trial for um, endovascular therapy, ISAT, published in 2002. Um, I'm very familiar with the trial because uh, we were the only center in the USA. Actually, I, I think we're the, o- the only center in North America to participate in ISAT. And Kieran Murphy was the endovascular interventional neuroradiologist. And Daniel Rigamonti was the, uh, the neurosurgeon. Now, the, the main problem with ISAT was that only 17% of the patients from the original group uh, were um, included in the study. So there were... Uh, over 9,500 patients admitted to 43 centers. Right off the bat, 78% were excluded. Um, and uh, of the 22% that were randomized, there was an 11% dropout at two months and a 23% dropout at 10 years. Um, the requirements for uh, uh, participating in the trial were stricter for endovascular neurosurgeons and neuroradiologists than for open surgeons. Therefore, uh, in general, you have a higher quality endovascular uh, 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 practitioners than open neurosurgeons. And uh, one of the main problems is that uh, they have not published and we cannot obtain the repeat treatment uh, numbers uh, uh, except for uh, this paper that came out in 2007 that uh, the report reported the retreatment uh, uh, rate of uh, ISAT patients. Uh, this patient paper by Campy showed that um, there, there was uh, in the endovascular group uh, three times as many retreatments. And it, it would have been uh, probably even higher because uh, of the 30 patients that required three treatment uh, retreatments in the um, open group, uh, these 30 patients had no PLIP applied, which is uh, really amazing. Uh, but, um, but then uh, the combined uh, retreatments um, for endovascular and, uh, and neurosurgery um, were 17.4% for endovascular and 3.8% for, uh, for uh, open surgery. Um, they, they published this paper in 2015, the 10-year results. And again, they did not report the, the repeat treatment uh, rates. Uh, but uh, in terms of re-bleeds, the, uh, three, three times as many patients in the endovascular group um, had to be retreated. So um, obviously, um, uh, more, uh, more needed to be done. The, the other big uh, coiling uh, 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 paper is this uh, paper, uh, you know, Cameron McDougall's and um, and uh, uh, Spetzler, Robert Spetzler's uh, study, the, the Brad uh, trial. Uh, this is a very good study, um, single institution, but very high quality. The main problem was that uh, there was a high crossover from coiling to clipping and, um, and a very uh, a slow, a very low crossover to clip to coil, but nevertheless, the the um, the the numbers are are very important and very interesting. Um, at uh, at 10, 10 years, they published this paper, and they showed that there were uh, equivalent good outcomes in both groups, but the extent for aneurysm obliteration was significantly higher in the clipping group and aneurysm recurrences and retreatments were significantly higher with uh, coiling. And here you see that, um, that you know, the uh, MRS scores and overall deaths were similar for the two groups, but the retreatment rates uh, were significantly higher in endovascular, 20% as opposed to 0.8%. And again, the complete obliteration rate was uh, 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 lower. Um, so, um, uh, so then uh, we started accruing uh, data on, on endovascular uh, treatments. Uh, we have the ISAT with a follow-up, year, uh, follow-up period of 1.7 years, um, showing a retreatment rate of 17.4% and BRAT uh, at 10 years, uh, showing a rate of uh, 20%. And, and then, but then again, uh, people listening to say, say but are, are these rele- relevant numbers today? You know, GDC is uh, in the past, you know, we have GDCs in the 
rear view mirror and what we're dealing with now are uh, pipeline and webs that are much superior. But the question is, are they? So how is the pipeline holding up? Uh, so this is study from the, uh, this year, a lot of very good information has come out. Um, uh, so uh, this is a study from the University of Utah where they use the premier health care database, which is a database um, primarily designed for pipelines, but, but it, it accrues uh, other cases. And, and what you see is that um, uh, they compare the pipeline treated aneurysms with uh, non-pipeline treated um, uh, aneurysms. These are mostly uh, coilings with uh, uh, other stents. And, um, and you see that, that even though the pipeline is an advance at two years, it, um, it has a, a retreatment rate of 8.1%. Um, so, so here we have, um, uh, a uh, ISAN and Brat with 17.4% um, uh, uh, um, retreatment rate at one year, 20% um, uh, at uh, 10 years, but then uh, the pipeline is um, uh, better than coiling, but, uh, but it's still worrisome that, that there's such a high retreatment rate. Um, how about the web? So the web is more recent, uh, but this is a, um, a French study which looks at two uh, uh, prospective multi-center web trials, uh, webcast and webcast uh, two. And, and what you see is that the retreatment rate at three years is now 11.4% for the, for the web. Uh, so then uh, we, we have these numbers of uh, endovascular treatment and uh, and uh, we, we can start uh, doing some analysis. So, so this is a, a curve that I created uh, looking at, endo, at, at these endovascular uh, treatments. And what you see is that we have solid data uh, at 10 years from BRAT. Now that was uh, granted coiling, but, but if you can see the, the pipeline results at two years and the web results at three years, um, the pipeline uh, now has a, a retreatment rate of uh, 8.1%, uh, web at three years, 11.4%. And, um, and it is following a trajectory uh, that is gonna put it um, at about 20% at, um, at uh, uh, 10 years. And, and then if you extrapolate using this model, um, it seems that uh, one out of four patients treated endovascularly are gonna require retreatment in, um, in 20 years and one out of three are gonna require retreatment in, in 30 years. Now, that, that is not the end of the world, but, uh, but if you are a young patient, um, um, uh, that, that implies a tremendous uh, follow-up, you know, having MRIs uh, repeatedly, every time the MRI shows something abnormal, then uh, you have to have an angiogram. What, what we're dealing with is something that, uh, that a, uh, a company in Stanford, Connecticut uh, popularized, and, and that is what has become known as the Gardner Curve of Technological Innovation. Any technological innovation, uh, and actually it applies to uh, anything in life, you know, uh, hobbies and relationships and all that, you know, uh, follows this, this Gardner Curve, where, where you have the technology trigger, and then you have a rapid increase in uh, expectations where you reach this peak of inflated expectations, and then you start seeing the problems with your uh, new technology. It leads to what they call the trough of disillusionment, uh, slope of enlightenment, and then a plateau of productivity where the technology, if the technology survives the, uh, the trough, then, then it reaches a, a plateau. And then applying this to, to endovascular innovation, uh, you have here the, the GDC, so the trigger was in 1991, and uh, initially there was tremendous enthusiasm, and then we started seeing the retreatments and the failures. Uh, but then as the technique was uh, stabilizing, then there was a new technology trigger, and that was the introduction of the pipeline. And then the pipeline then elevated the expectations, uh, uh, saying, well, you know, um, this uh, this is much better than the GDC and it's going to do much better than the GDCs. 
Um, and uh, but then as, as we start to see the problems with the pipeline, primarily the recurrence rates, then uh, there has been a new uh, technology trigger uh, web. And, and these, um, uh, uh, the enthusiasm for the technologies has, uh, has increased. And, um, and basically what's gonna happen in the future is, is unclear. Um, you know, it, it may be that the, the combination of endovascular therapy is gonna surpass the initial expectations. Um, or it's going to be slightly above initial expect expectations or, or below. And, and that's where, where we are now. Now, this is uh, our experience at Hopkins. And, and what you can see, um, this I've been tracking uh, uh, what we do for the past 30 years. And in 1991, of course, 100% uh, of the aneurysms were being done uh, by open surgery, which is a red line. Um, by 2012, primarily because of the introduction of the pipeline, the two lines crossed. And then we had this period uh, of uh, a tremendous enthusiasm for endovascular uh, techniques. Now, what happened during this period of 2014 to 2017 uh, was that, that the, um, uh, uh, it, it was our uh, attempt to, to really pursue to the maximum the endovascular uh, techniques. Now, the, the way the numbers were uh, calculated, um, uh, you know, I have to explain that. But, but what I want to point out was that in 2012, uh, we, we were like uh, at a 50-50 ratio, and, and now we have returned to a 50-50 ratio. So the, the micro, microsurgical to endovascular case ratio at Hopkins is one to one. Now, why, why did we have this uh, burst um, in 2014, 2017? First of all, it's a way that, that we counted the aneurysm cases. So one patient can generate multiple cases. You know, if um, uh, with, uh, with microsurgery, one of the things that, that we try to do is when we go in uh, to the surgery, we try to clip all the aneurysms at once. But um, uh, traditionally in endovascular, uh, even though multiple aneurysms are now being treated, um, it, it was uh, dogma that you, you should treat only one aneurysm at a time. Uh, in addition to that, uh, there was a, a preference for inserting only one device at, at a time. For example, um, a, if a patient was going to have uh, stent coiling, they would uh, uh, have the, the coiling and then would come back for, for the stent or pipeline. Uh, which would count as, as two uh, aneurysm events or two aneurysm cases. Um, uh, uh, therefore, a single endovascular patient would generate multiple treatments. Uh, this was also a period of, of uh, pipeline uh, Gartner type exuberance uh, that, that is being followed by a correction. Uh, during this period, we went up to treating uh, 256 to 347 aneurysm cases per year. But in the last three years, we're back to our baseline 160 aneurysm cases, uh, which with much better outcomes um, and, and currently a ratio of micro, microsurgical to endovascular uh, ratio of one to one. Uh, one of the things that, for example, we explored was this uh, paper um, of uh, the H construct for, construct for anterior communicating artery aneurysms where, where they would be coiled and then recoiled and then have stents placed in both H1s, but we have realized that this is not, uh, not a, a good option. Uh, it, um, it was associated with a, a high um, uh, morbidity and even mortality. Um, so, so what is the state of the art? Um, I, I have uh, spent uh, you know, a lot of time talking about uh, the, the, the limitations of endovascular, but, but then the question is how how is uh, microsurgery doing? And I will address that in the final segment of this. Uh, this is my, um, and I'll, I'll leave this up um, for a second for the residents if they wanna take a, uh, a screenshot of this. This is my view of, um, of, of the state of uh, aneurysm treatment at this point. Uh, for instance, I think that for uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysms and MCAs clipping is the first choice for posterior communicating or choroidal aneurysms, I think they can go either way. Basilar apex um, are um, uh, primarily being treated uh, by, uh, by endovascular. I think pica aneurysms um, are still better treated 
uh, by open clipping. And then of course, clinoidal, ophthalmic and superior hypothesial artery aneurysm are better treated uh, endovascularly. Um, so uh, why, why do I say that ACOMs and MCAs um, are better for clipping? Is that with, with clipping, uh, the results are, are very good and, um, and it's a, essentially a done deal. You don't have to um, follow these patients uh, because they, the recurrence rate is very low. Um, this is a paper that is going to be coming out by Eric Nussbaum. E Eric, uh, as, as most of you know, uh, does outstanding work in, in Minneapolis, Minnesota. And he has a, a tremendous uh, solo experience uh, with uh, anterior communicating artery aneurysms. And he is reporting here on his uh, on 300 cases where uh, patients were able to re re uh, return to their previous lifestyle with no modifications at a rate of 96%. He had uh, uh, a 1% death um, and, uh, and poor outcomes. Uh, but but as, again, the results are, are really good. And that's this is very typical of, uh, of the current microsurgical treatment of acomaneurisms. Uh, what complications were unique to neurosurgery, um, hematomas, um, cranial nerve palsy, and uh, anosmia that a, a lot of patients suffer after, uh, well, not a lot of patients, but patients suffer after this treatment. However, what are the, what, what are the complications unique to endovascular treatment? I don't show this, but he, he did a review of the, of the literature of endovascular treatment of acomaneurysm. Uh, but, uh, you know, the problems have been major bleeding after antiplatelet regimen, so delayed subarachnoid hemorrhage and uh, coil protrusion and herniation. Um, how about middle cerebral artery aneurysms? So this is a very interesting paper. And Ra Rafael, would you yes. mind going back to that? Because I also noticed something that is very relevant. Uh, go back to the, the one before, yeah. The complications, yes. the complication uh, slide, even one before this one right okay. here. Okay. You get that one right there. The very top one, the ischemia and infarction, surgical versus endovascular, right. much higher and the endovascular too, significant yeah. as well. Isn't yeah. that, so I just, I just noticed that as the first line as well, that it seems to be peculiar as well. Yeah, and, so, and, and it, is, it is, that is correct. That has been my experience uh, as gotcha. well. So, uh, so how about MCA aneurysm? So this is a very interesting paper from France. There are these two uh, extremely high quality institutions that are essentially across the street from each other. Not exactly, but they're, they're very nearby. And in one institution, they have a clip first policy for MCA aneurysms. And in the other institution, they have a coil first uh, policy. And, uh, and what you see again, going to retreatments, uh, the, the coiling retreatment rate um, is uh, uh, the combined rate at 24 months is 2.3 uh, plus 4.5. So that is a retreatment rate at, at two years of 6.8% uh, for, for the coiled MCA aneurysms. Whereas for clipping is 1.1% uh, early on and, and there are no late uh, retreatments, which is a, the same thing that was found in, in BRAT. Um, for ruptured middle cerebral ar artery aneurysms, the death rate was much higher with uh, with uh, coiling, and uh, that's probably because there, there were several patients in extremis that, uh, that uh, were uh, uh, treated uh, with uh, coiling. Uh, for unruptured aneurysms, uh, the death rate was much higher uh, for clipping, uh, but, but the overall results uh, show that, uh, that clipping is, uh, is competitive and fav favorable. So, uh, so then where does that leave us? And, um, and essentially, uh, the uh, you know I I don't want to say uh, I don't want to get into the old uh, fr frame of mind whether one is better than the other. I mean they're they're both very very powerful and very effective techniques. But but what I what I'm uh, uh, postulating here is that uh, that open surgery for aneurysms is not going in a, away anytime soon because despite the initial exuberance over endovascular uh, treatments, we're seeing uh, uh, problems with that, which is, which is expected. You know, any, any technology is gonna have problems. So at this point, um, endovascular uh, treatment um, is being considered for older patients, 
which I would say older than 65. Uh, younger patients, I think, should be treated with, uh, with microsurgery uh, because they have a longer uh, lifespan and, um, and uh, uh, the possibility for retreatment is very high. Um, the patients with minimal morbidities um, are good for microsurgery. Patients who have a contraindication for antiplatelet uh, drugs are good for microsurgery. And then uh, patients with difficult arterial access, like cervical ICA stenosis or tortuous uh, vasculature. Now, uh, aneurysm features, uh, as I've shown you, are very important for this. So in, um, in terms of locations, um, in my opinion, MCA and ACOM aneurysms are better treated uh, with a clip first uh, policy. Small size aneurysms are, are better treated uh, uh, with uh, surgery, um, except in locations like uh, the, the clinoidal segment and superior hyp hypophyseal. If a patient has had two recurrences of, after endovascular therapy, I think that's a uh, that's a uh, time for uh, surgery. And of course, wide neck bifurcation aneurysms are, are uh, uh, good candidates for surgery. Um, and then there are non-aneurysmal anatomical factors. For example, if a patient presents with a hematoma or mass effect, there, there's really uh, no point in, in taking the hematoma and then doing uh, coiling uh, or for the aneurysm. Uh, it's better just to to treat them uh, endovascular. And then there's special circumstances like this oculomotor uh, neuropathy. And uh, I'll, I'll just spend a, a couple of slides about that. We published uh, uh, this uh, paper in 2015, uh, combining uh, uh, cases uh, with uh, uh, the uh, Emory University. And these are, you know, uh, my cases and then Dan Barrow's cases. And, uh, and basically, what it shows is that, that uh, if you have a patient with an oculomotor nerve palsy secondary to a PCOM, um, they do better with, uh, with uh, clipping than with coiling. Um, as you see, the, the full resolution rates with uh, clipping is in red and with um, uh, coiling is in, um, in green. So, and it stands to reason that, that uh, the, the sooner you remove the mass effect, the, the better the patients are, are going to do. To do um, uh, they, this as uh, this uh, uh, phenomenon uh, has been uh, uh, identified in this uh, uh, review and meta analysis um, uh, by Sheng uh, from uh, Germany and China, um, and uh, and then this paper uh, that uh, came out in November of 2020 uh, from China shows the, the same the same thing where where patients. Uh, have a better uh, 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 ophthalmic outcome uh, at that time. So, um, so at this point, the the uh, advantages of uh, microsurgery are lower recurrence rates, um, follow up after one year is rarely necessary, and there are uh, no long term medications uh, that have to be taken for endovascular. The advantages is that it's a less invasive intervention. Uh, it's a one to two week uh, recovery from ruptured aneurysms. For the disadvantages for microsurgery are uh, that it's a more invasive intervention and it requires a six week recovery for ruptured aneurysms. But the disadvantage, disadvantages for endovascular are that you have re higher recurrence rates and need retreatment and a lifetime of follow-up is uh, necessary, including uh, catheter and geography. So um, I I'll leave this uh, slide up. Uh, for a second for the residents if they want to take a, a, a screenshot, but, uh, but basically this summarizes, um, you know, my impression of uh, how these aneurysms should be triaged uh, at this point and when, when you should pursue open surgery and then endovascular surgery. And using this, um, uh, this algorithm, uh, you know, at, at Hopkins, we're treating um, half of the aneurysms are endovascular, uh, half are uh, neurosurgery. And um, and I'm I'm really happy with the results that we're uh, having with you know the best in the the last uh, thirty years. So, uh, in conclusion, open microsurgery remains an essential technique for aneurysms, and it's very important to continue to train uh, train our residents uh, and uh, and uh, provide the opportunity for them to excel in this area. Endovascular advances over the past thirty years 
have been very impressive and they continue at a very rapid pace. But aneurysm recurrence and rupture have been since the beginning and remain at the present the major concerns of an endovascular treatment, which at this point requires close and ongoing clinical and radiological follow-up for the patients. And the retreatment rates remain the best measure, uh, in my opinion, by which to assess the efficacy of aneurysm treatment uh, modalities. Um, so again, thank you uh, so much uh, for the uh, opportunity uh, to present. It's, it's really a, a great honor to, to be back and see uh, my dear friends, Alfredo um, and Kai, uh, for whom I have tremendous admiration and affection. Um, and um, uh, anyway, it's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Thank you, Rafael. What a tour de force. Amazing. So I can I know that I'm getting text messages already from several people. I'm going to go to Dr. Miller and then I'm going to go to Gabriel from uh, Colombia for some comments, some questions, and then potentially to Ravi and uh, and Dean and Chris Fox. So I, I apologize. I want to be respectful of Rafael and everybody's time. I know we're running a few minutes behind, but it is such an important topic that we cannot leave without some comments. Dr. No, Miller, I, please. I have all, yes. all morning, Alfred. Okay, no thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you, Rafael. Thank you. All right, Dr. Well, Miller, go ahead. I, I'll try to be brief. Yes, Rafael, it's a, it's a fantastic talk, and, and it was wonderful David, to see you David, it's great to see you. Yeah. Good to see you, sir. You, 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 you have done, as, as I knew you would do when I first met you, you've done fantastic work. For those yeah, uh, they, I, I David, did work. Dave, David and I worked together in the lab many years ago. Yeah, it's great to see you. It's good to see you as well. And it's just fantastic work. Um, I, you know, I think one of the real important things that 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 you bring up is that, uh, and and it, you know, Dr. Um, Q and, and Kai and those people have brought here is is a marriage of different uh, specialties. You know, the the you know in, in the early days, and I remember when you know when when coiling was really a radiology thing. It was developed sort of with the radiology folks, and there was a little bit of uh, competition and, and and a little bit of radiologists mostly did this and surgeons did the open and there wasn't as much a mix and the, the, the society was called the American Society of Interventional and Therapeutic Neuroradiology and and the, you know and the surgeons came and said okay you know we, we understand that this is working well for certain patients we think this is good we want to we, we, are, we are going to get into this we want to do this right what how do you do what you do and you know the society sort of merged and and it's become uh, obviously that, that that's how things advance. It's a, it's really a a, a a look for the or a search for the tool right tool for the job. And I think that's one of the things that you brought out so well in your talk. There are certain situations in which one treatment is is probably better, and in a, another situation where the other is probably better. And it's 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 recognizing that working together not only to figure the right treatment for the patient but also using the perspective of both specialties to advance things and to and to look for the next uh, for the next best thing uh, and I, I as i said as has been been said here you you did an extremely great job of of pointing out the the weaknesses and the strengths of of all of this and we really appreciate it it's 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 uh, it was a wonderful talk and it was great to see you yeah david, thank you so thank you very much david thank you for for your kind words and so david awesome. and rafael so what i gathered right here is that is 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 not just the technologies are good. I think Rafael, you said both technologies are amazing. They're not going anywhere anyway. So the question is, can we merge the teams working on the patient to discuss and then come up with plans that people will feel this is the best therapy for this potential patient and then getting back to the patient and then saying, what is the preference of the patient? Because I saw that yes. at the top of yes. your, your yes. discussion being like this. And ultimately the patient, you present the data said, we as a multidisciplinary team have an experience, good experience, and both this is what we think, but this is your preference is respected as well. And it sounds to me very, very important. I'm gonna to go to Gabriel now from Bucaramanga from Colombia, who was putting comments on the chat. Gabriel, go ahead. Oh, uh, thank you very much, Dr. Quinones. Uh, Dr. Tamargo, thank you for your excellent talk. And um, just I want to, to do some uh, comments. I learned to clip an evidence from Dr. Heros in Minneapolis. And uh, that, at that time was Dr. Nussbaum uh, was on my, my uh, classmate at that time. And to, to have the same experience of Dr. Nussbaum, a, a, a communicated artery aneurysm is not easy. Uh, but uh, we need to train, uh, as Dr. Quinones says, the neurosurgeons for continue 
learning how to clip aneurysm that's difficult these days because endovascular treatment is is you know is, is doing too much in order to train people in order to develop technology not clipping clipping is like uh, still not moving of technology but we need to learn anatomy we have here on the talk uh, people from uh, the University of Santander, but also from the military hospital, the chairman of that, uh, my kids are, uh, are studying there. Dr. Luke showed us uh, recently 1,400 aneurysm clipping, which is a very great experience on clipping aneurysm. So we need to, to maintain the, the surgery for the neurosurgeons, the training for the neurosurgeons, of course, endovascular is excellent, but there are many, many aneurysms that could be clipping and we need to, to, to do the first choice for clipping because the problem today in Colombia, at least as many places, don't allow to, to, to even the neurosurgeon uh, 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 solve the case because they have the diagnostic and then they go to endovascular treatment without any opinion of the neurosurgeon, which is very, very bad. So thank you very much, Dr. Tamargo. And, uh, and of course, uh, uh, all the your vision of what aneurysm should be clipping and what aneurysm should be do by endovascular is excellent. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank, thank, you, you, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you, Rafael. This is great. I, I know I have Chris Fox right here and I have Ravi. And, and Chris, they look at this recurrence rate at the University of Florida. He was there with Brian Ho. He was texting me some of the numbers. Chris, your questions and comments. Yes, hi, Dr. Tamargo. Amazing talk. Thank you so much for coming. And I still remember my interview with you at Hopkins more than 20 years ago now. You were so kind, and I really appreciate how well you treat everyone and medical students and residents coming through. So thank you very much. My pleasure. Um, it, as uh, Q was saying, we when I was at Florida, we reviewed both our clipping and foiling uh, recurrence rates um, from about a 15-year period, uh, 2005 to 2020, roughly. And uh, in, in line with what you mentioned, the uh, recurrence rates for um, coiling uh, were much higher, um, you know, in the range of 15 to 20 percent. Interestingly, we found that um, the, the recurrence rates for aneurysms that were clipped that where a residual had to be left were much higher than we thought they were going to be, um, but still much less than, than coiling. So I, I agree that there's certainly um, a, a need to continue to clip aneurysms and many aneurysms should be clipped. I think one thing that's difficult is so many patients want, all they hear is minimally invasive and that's all they want, right? I mean, they hear I'll, I'll be out of the hospital with a needle stick now in my wrist instead of even my groin. And they're so um, zoned in on that. I was curious um, about your thoughts and, and how do you um, kind of discuss that with patients? Yeah, so, so basically um, I, I think you just, you ju just present them with the facts, you know, and say, uh, say uh, look, you have a, an anterior communicating artery aneurysm. Uh, this aneurysm could be treated uh, both with surgery or with endovascular. Um, the, the benefits of uh, surgery are that basically uh, you, uh, uh, this is gonna be most likely a one-time event in your life. You're gonna be off duty for, uh, for six weeks, but then after that, you don't have to worry about it. There's, there's really no, um, uh, I, you know, no radiological follow-up and, um, and uh, uh, but it's a bigger deal, you know. You uh, you're going to be in the hospital for four or five days and uh, have a, an incision and all that. Uh, but but then the advantage is that you're done. Endovascular, on the other hand, it's simpler. You come in and the the next day you leave the hospital. You you can be back to work in uh, five to seven days. But the problem is uh, you're going to uh, be taking uh, aspirin for the rest of your life, and that's going to be very important. Um, and we're going to need to do follow up. So uh, we're going to need to do either CTAs or MRIs every one to three years. And if we see something suspicious, you're going to have the angiogram again, and you may need treatment and, um, and, uh, and, and explain that 
you know, the, the statistics are that within the first 10 years, they have a 25, um, they, they have a, um, a 25%, a 20% chance of requiring retreatment. And then, and then just allow them to, to make the decision. So, um, and, and patients, you know, will sort themselves out. I, I think that uh, 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 maybe it's because of a referral pattern, you know, because I think the uh, patients that are uh, satisfied having endovascular treatment uh, stay locally, but then patients that required uh, clipping, you know, move around. But, uh, but I present things that way to the patients. And, uh, and, and there are many that are willing to, uh, to undergo the clipping. The, the fact that that they will be free from the medical system, you know, uh, as opposed to yeah. having a, a a chronic condition like diabetes that requires them to be followed very closely. You know, it's very appealing to a lot of patients. But uh, uh, but you know, but that that's the way I present it, and I I think that uh, patients sort themselves out, and and a lot of them choose uh, to um, uh, to have the surgery uh, so that they can be done with uh, uh with their sure. aneurysm you know cure yeah, that's i mean that yeah that's uh, that's very helpful i'm gonna you know kind of think about that as i as i talk to patients and it, try to and sort out it, oftentimes it, it's so hard the one other uh, can i ask one other question q yeah, yeah just please, about please, yeah. Uh, about follow-up we found that in, in our series of clipped patients the risk of de novo aneurysm formation was about four or five percent. Do you, for younger patients in particular, do you do long-term imaging follow-up? You mentioned yes. that you pretty much don't, but I was curious about that in particular. Yeah. So, uh, you know, so, so you know, as uh, as all of you know, uh, aneurysms are primarily congenital lesions. So, patients uh, at this point it's about three percent of the population. Patients are born with a defect in the media. And and the uh, and the common sites for that um, are the anterior communicating region, posterior communicating MCA, and so on. Um, so the aneurysms uh, develop over time. Uh, so you you start to see them when patients are in the 30s and 40s, and they start to rupture in the late 50s and and 60s. So if I if I um, uh, have a patient, I treat a patient with clipping. Uh, with uh, uh, with an aneurysm and they are younger than 50 years old, then um, I tell them that we need follow-up. So for example, if they're 40 years old, um, I will do um, another either CTA or uh, MRA um, uh, in five years. And then again, when they're 50 years old. Now, if they're older than 50 years old, now it happens, you know, I, I mean, I've had uh, patients older than 50 that have developed new aneurysms. But, uh, uh, but, but it's, it's rare in my opinion. So uh, if they are, you know, let's say 60 years old and I clip their aneurysm, you know, I, uh, I don't, uh, I, I don't uh, do follow-up. Now, the exceptions to that are, are patients with uh, a history, a family history of aneurysms. If they have a, a first order relative, so that is a, a mother or father or brother or sister, with uh, with aneurysms, then then that that patient is at higher risk, so they need you know closer uh, follow up. Um, if um, and also their family members need to be followed. I tell them that for their children, they they should start having CTAs when they're twenty five years old. Um, and and again, these are these are for patients with a family history of aneurysms, which is rare, but but you know it happens. Um, but I tell them that their children should start having CTAs when they're 25 years old and repeat them every five years until until they're 50. Uh, but that's that's a follow follow up that I use. Thank you, Rafael. Thank, Thank you, you very the much. Other thing, the other thing about the presenting to the patient, then I'm going to go to Ravi. I did take a picture of that amazing table, you know, uh, when talking to the patient about the pros and cons in different regions of the brain, different types of aneurysms. I think that that's. That was a great point. I took several pictures, Rafael, to keep because when we discuss with the patients, you can tell them a little bit about your own potential bias given the history. Yes. And we understand from the literature and where you have categorized the comorbidities, locations, and stuff like that. So they are well informed. And I think that that, that table to me is it's really precious because it's uh, 30 years of your experience reviewing tons of literature. These are not 
easy things to put together. So, so thank you. That goes to Chris. So, Ravi, go ahead. Uh, you know, um, I know that uh, you were yes. each to comment. So uh, again, talk, thank you so much, Dr. Tamargo. It's a, it's a great pleasure for me to meet you, at least virtually, although I have heard a lot of you of, uh, from my, Chris Ogilvy, who is my co-fellow in Buffalo. So it's sometimes when you know a friend of a friend, you just know them almost. But uh, what I can say clearly about you is uh, the difference. Even Chris Ogilvy did train in endovascular. There is uh, only few people left with your level of expertise in open vascular surgeon. Uh, that almost I can, you know, I mean, even though there's many other surgeons, but the Hopkins experience is almost Dr. Tamargo's experience. So this is, uh, not many institutions can say this because there is people who come in and out and so forth. You know, when you said the Barrow Neurological Institute, like the BNI trial, very similar situation where you have a surgeon who does predominantly most of the cases. So uh, people like you are rare nowadays, and I don't know if we would be able to reproduce this level of expertise in open surgery. Uh, and this is a, a, a very unfortunate, uh, but, but requires a lot. It, it's an uphill fight and requires a lot of energy to, to be with. with Rabbi, notice, notice how Raphael, he welcomed the technology. He embraced it and opened it up. And then he began to pay attention, not only what was going on nationally, internationally, but also in our own group and realized like anything, there's a peak and then there's going to be a decline and then eventually gets to the middle. So eventually now I think they reach, he reached with his own team at Hopkins, a level that is appropriate for the patient. And notice that he's now 50-50, you know, when you look back. So I think that people like Raphael, they continue to trade. He stayed true to his uh, trade, which is open, welcome the technology, pay attention to the literature and said, okay, the truth is going to be somewhere in the middle. And that's where he is today you know, in this service. And I think that that's Absolutely. for the benefit of the patient. This, and this reflects the honesty of the surgeon basically being driven by data and information instead of pure attitude. And again, hats down to Dr. Tamargo. The one point that I like to highlight is nowadays what I call the high variability of treatment of aneurysm because we have so many people treating aneurysm with different levels of expertise from a person who spent only six months at a fellowship, saw a few cases to people like Dr. Tamargo, who has done it for years and years and years and know much more. So uh, I still encourage people to, to be truly honest to their patients, not thinking that. And, and to be honest, you know, I mean, I don't think it's fair to say the the results of aneurysm surgery in Dr. Tamargo's hands are going to be similar to uh, the new generation at this point. And this is something to be taken in, in, in consideration. Uh, so, you know, it, I mean, I can speak to, too many, but again, it's a great pleasure for me. Dr. Tamargo is the real, uh, real master uh, open surgeon when it comes to, and I have seen so many patients, so many of your outcomes over the years and, and the great results. So okay. Maybe we pivot for the last question, Rafael, that, that that's actually Gabriel has it right here in the chat, you know, uh, how do you train? Because this has to do with what Ravi just said. How do we train the residents of today yeah. so that way they're ready? So that's it. Last question, if yeah. you don't mind. Yeah, so, so Alfredo, so the, uh, I'll tell you what, what has happened. What, what has happened is that when, when endovascular came, came around, it was so exciting that, uh, that, that even I, you know, when I, when I talked to the residents, and they said, you know, I want to be clipping aneurysm. And I said, well, you got to be careful because uh, you're, you're not going to be able to make a living doing that. You know, uh, the field is moving and all that. So during that time, uh, there was a decrease in the number of people that wanted to, to uh, work in, in, in open surgery. But then as things are changing, you know, like right now, uh, I, I have, uh, I, I have uh, uh, out, outstanding fellows, you know, because people, people are realizing that, uh, that uh, endovascular techniques um, uh, are, are making progress, but, but you, you need high quality uh, clipping. Now, you know, what, one field that, that is in a way uh, ahead of, of where we are right now is for, uh, for acoustic neuromas, you know, because when, when radio surgery was introduced uh, at that time, you know, in, in every uh, academic institution, there, there, was, there were a few surgeons that specialized in, in acoustic neuromas, but then uh, people became 
uh, disinterested in it, you know, in, in, in that procedure. And then, uh, but then when we started seeing problems with radio surgery, recurrences and, and, and the fact that, you know, uh, the hearing uh, rate, uh, the hearing loss rate is very high and the recurrence rate is high within. So, so now there's a, a, a resurgence of, uh, of interest in that. So, uh, so it's, it's an ebb and flow, but, but again, the, the circumstances uh, provide the opportunity to, to, uh, to uh, get bright uh, young people to, to come in and, and uh, devote themselves to, uh, and, uh, uh, to training in open surgery as well. Thank you, Rafael. One last little question from, from Thien, actually, from Dr. Newton, who's here, who's one of our recent recruits for endovascular. Thien, you want to ask the question, Dr. Tamargo, and then we close. Yeah, sorry, I don't mean to belabor it. And I just uh, thank you so much for all your experience. Just the Gartner curve alone speaks to all the, you know, how we're handling all these new technologies. So it really puts some peace of mind of just what we're experiencing in the field. But um, just one last thing, kind of off topic, but, um, you know, one thing is that we're trying to help the surgeons and uh, plan for cases and things like that. And some aneurysms, as you know, are probably very thick walled atherosclerotic. Some are very thin walled daughter, have tiny daughter sacs, high risks. You know, sometimes you want to know these things ahead of time prior to the surgery. You know, one thing we're trying to develop here is our MR vessel wall imaging program. And uh, we yes, can really yeah. start to see aneurysms extremely in fine detail now. I, I know Hopkins leads the field a lot with carotid vessel wall imaging. I don't know if you have any experience with uh, with intracranial vessel wall imaging. I'm just curious. Well, uh, well the, the, that, that is that is a, a holy grail of, uh, of radiology, you know, finding out what is the status of the, uh, of the vessel wall. At this point, we only have an indirect measure uh, because uh, you look on the angiogram and if the aneurysm is deviating from the, the, the shallow dome uh, ideal, you know, any deviation from that speaks uh, to, to a, a thinning wall. But again, uh, this is a very challenging issue to find out what is the status of the wall of the aneurysm. Um, it, it, even though there have been advances uh, peripherally, um, intracranially, um, still, you know, there, there's really no good way to, to uh, assess the vessel wall. I, I know that there are protocols, but, uh, but you know, uh, uh, here uh, we, we have a few uh, protocols, but I, I still, they, they still have a long way to go. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, thank you Thien. And Raphael, as you can see, there's a tremendous excitement. Everybody stayed here. A lot of discussions. The chat is super busy. Mm -hmm. uh, we look forward to having you in person. I think that you love, I think that you were here for the NSA a few years back uh, in the beach at the Ponte Vedra and Club. I know you like the beach, so we'll, we'll have you in person and maybe we do a little course for some anatomical dissection with you, spend the whole day as a visiting professor in person. This is the best we can do given the limitations today, but I think hopefully later in the year things will open and maybe in 2022 we'll get you here in person to spend time with us and our residents and our fellows. Well, my pleasure, Alfredo. And again, thank you so much for having me. And I, I look forward to, uh, to a visit if uh, uh, I would be honored to, to be there. And uh, uh, I, again, it's, I, I just can't thank you enough uh, for your friendship and support and, um, and, and for the opportunity to be with you this morning. Thank you, Rafael. Have a great, great day in the rest of the week. And everybody, thank you. <laughs> Adios. <laughs> Adios. Adios. Bye. Adios. Bye.